oscilloscopes and signal generators are handy tools in our labs. Unfortunately, they are not cheap. What if you had such devices already and did not know? Stay tuned and I will tell you about it. Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. Remember, if you subscribe, you will always sit in the first row. All newer PCs have loudspeakers and a microphone, so they can create sound as well as record it, and usually in decent quality, like oscilloscopes and signal generators. We only need a connection and software to create the desired waveforms and visualize the measured voltages. Fortunately, such software is available. And the best? We can use it free of charge. So our setup looks like that. We have a PC with a sound card. Sound cards consist of digital to analog converters to create analog signals from a digital source as well as analog to digital converters to create digital signals from analog voltages. And because we want to have at least stereo signals, they usually have two of them. So what can we do with this setup? What are its limitations? What are the advantages? And how can we extend it to remove some of the limitations? Let's start with typical scenarios. We want to know how good a filter or an amplifier works and measure the frequency response. Or we need a sine wave to test a device on our bench. Or a square wave. Or white noise. Or we have a signal and want to know its waveform and its frequency. Or we have a loudspeaker and want to know its quality and check its frequency response. For all these applications, we have to connect the in and outputs of the sound card to our devices on the bench. I created these two cables with jacks on one side and screw terminals on the other. I used 6.3 mm jacks because my external sound card uses this standard. But you might use the typical 3.5 mm jacks. The cables have to have at least two wires plus a shield. Connect both wires if you want to use both channels. But before we start, I want to tell you about some limitations. Because sound cards are made for low power applications, they only produce small voltages and measure small voltages. This is why I inserted this 20k potentiometer as a voltage divider. Like that, I can measure higher voltages without destroying the input. Keep in mind that we misuse our sound cards, so we have to assume that they are not well protected against overvoltage. Make sure you stay below 1 volt or so. If you do not want to risk your PC's sound card, it's probably a good idea to purchase an external one. Simple sound cards are not very expensive. And now we come to the software. I found two different packages, ARTA and REW or Room EQ Wizard. Both are made for acoustic measurements and both are very powerful in this matter. However, because I am a complete noob in the acoustic domain, they have way more possibilities than I can use. So it's up to you to experiment if you want to get good at that topic. Both have commonalities. They have a generator and a recorder. Most measurements in the acoustic domains are made using both. The generator creates a signal which is injected into the device under test or DUT. At the output of the DUT, the recorder visualizes the signal. A typical test is the sweep test, where the signal frequency is changed from a low to a high frequency and the recorder shows the amplitude of the signal. We know this from our antenna and RF filter measurements. And this is what I will do now. We create a simple low pass filter for 1 kHz and include it between the signal generator and the recorder. But wait, we forgot something. We need a base to compare. As with our VNAs in video number 359, we first have to calibrate our setup. Using REW, this is quickly done. 
we connect the output directly to the input and go to Preferences and Sound Card. Here we can choose our sound card. Choose the Java driver or if your sound card supports ASIO drivers, you can try those. We only use one channel for the calibration, which we have to select as output and input. Next, we must check the levels and adjust the input and output levels. Please always read the instructions in the help section. They are excellent. The levels can be adjusted with the sound settings in Windows. In Windows 10, you find them in sound settings. Because I use this external sound card, I have to adjust them using the dials on my Focusrite. Now we can start calibration. Just hit next a few times and you will get such a curve. The x-axis is the frequency from 2 to the maximum frequency in a logarithmic form. This means that the distance between 10 and 100 Hz is the same as between 1 kHz and 10 kHz. And for the y-axis, I choose dB volts because our ears somehow follow the decibel scale. From 20 to 10 kHz, the measurement is relatively flat and a little lower towards the ends. We see that the curve only goes to 24 kHz with a sample rate of 48 kHz. And we see another difference. This curve is with the Java driver and this is with the ASIO driver. It seems that the Java driver has its problems with higher frequencies. At a sampling rate of 192 kHz, the curve with the Java driver stops at a little above 22 kHz. The ASIO driver seems to support up to 96 kHz. And my sound card also seems to support such high frequencies. Anyway, the calibration file now can be stored. Create such a file for every sample rate you want to use later. Now we can create our first measurement. Stick with the level you choose before and do an SPL measurement. Skip this pop-up if it appears. We can recheck levels to be sure and then hit start. The same procedure as during calibration happens, but the resulting curve is very different. Now it is flat because REW compensated the curve we measured before. Now we are ready and can insert a DUT to see its effect. For our test, I will use a low pass filter for a cutoff frequency of 1 kHz consisting of an R and a C. Our online calculator shows that a 10 kilo ohm 16 nanofarad combination should do the trick. We insert this combo between the out and the input, select the measuring range and hit start. After selecting dB volt again, we see that the curve is very different. By the way, we can change the scale with a plus and minus sign and adjust its level with a rider. An RC low pass filter has a loss. Calibrated, we had a level of roughly minus 10 dB and now we start at minus 13 dB. And as expected or hoped, we see a drop around 1 kHz. Cool! And we see that it continues with the expected minus 20 dB per decade. So the higher the frequency, the more the filter blocks it. With a simple exchange of the R and the C, we create a high pass filter that blocks the low frequencies and let the higher frequencies pass. The cutoff frequency stays the same but it has less loss. Let's compensate for the loss of the low pass and create an active filter. This can be done using an op-amp. The most basic one should do it, the LM741. But because we work with bipolar signals, we have to feed it with plus minus volts. Fortunately, I got this mini power station, which creates not only 3.3 and 5 volts, but also plus minus 12 volt. A perfect solution. By the way, if you are interested in this device, you can check Valid's Kickstarter. This amplifier compensates for the loss of the RC filter. But we also see that the curve does not look nice after about 100 Hz. Good to know. Without our sound card instrument, I probably would not have detected this flaw. So what to do in this situation? As always, 
we tried capacitors on the power rails. And really, after adding these two capacitors, we get the correct curve. So our first measurements were a success. We can do more, of course. For example, we can open a generator window and generate a 100 Hz tone. And we can open an oscilloscope window that shows the output of the amplifier. If we change the frequency to 1 kHz, the output is already smaller. At 5 kHz it is very small, as expected. Now we have an independent signal generator and an oscilloscope. By the way, do not forget to hit the record button, otherwise you scratch your head while there is no signal. We can also generate a 100 Hz square wave signal and get a decent square wave at the output of the active filter. If I change to 1 kHz, the signal looks more than a sawtooth curve. Do you know why? Let's use another tool, the spectrum analyzer. It analyzes all frequencies of a particular signal. Here is what we see with a 1 kHz square wave at the input. It contains lots of harmonics spaced by 1 kHz. Every second harmonic has a much lower value. The harmonic at 20k is 25 dB lower than the 1 kHz harmonic. After the filter, as expected, the 1 kHz component is a little lower, but the harmonic at 20 kHz is now 50 dB lower. So we can see how we can create a sine from a square wave. Just create a filter for the harmonics. Of course, we would need a better filter as just a simple RC combination to remove all harmonics. And we saw an advantage of a sound card compared with an oscilloscope. Its dynamic range is much bigger because it uses 18 to 20 bit ADCs. Most oscilloscopes only use 8 to 10 bits. Therefore, we can measure much smaller values without changing the range. This was just an introduction to show you the possibilities of your ordinary PC sound card. There are much more possibilities. For example, you can attach a microphone instead of your probe to catch signals. Now you can use a loudspeaker as a DUT and measure its frequency response. Or you can build such an ARTA box to characterize your loudspeakers and optimize them. A lot of cool stuff for guys who want to experiment with audio. And if you replace the LM741 op-amp with such a power op-amp, you can create powerful signals to drive your loudspeaker or even a motor. Can this setup replace an oscilloscope and a signal generator? No, for sure not, because it has some disadvantages. The first flaw is that you have to pay attention to voltages because sound cards are made for small voltages. I used a voltage divider to protect the input. The second flaw is that you need an amplifier if you need bigger signals. The third flaw is that the measurements are not absolute. You can try to calibrate the output signal using a true RMS multimeter. But I would not trust that the PC and sound card do not insert some errors. The fourth flaw is that it only works with AC. It does not show DC components in your signals, so it cannot easily be used to drive or measure digital devices. And the fifth flaw is that its frequency range is limited. You for sure get up to around 20 kHz and, if you are lucky, to 96 kHz. Higher frequencies are not possible. Is this important? Yes, because as we saw, square waves for example contain a lot of harmonics. If you try to create and measure a 20 kHz square wave, you get a perfect sign because the generated signal does not contain harmonics and the scope cannot measure them. This is why your 100 MHz oscilloscope in reality only can be used up to about 30 MHz, because you at least want to catch three harmonics. Still, it is fun to play with audio signals free of charge. And if you are seriously into audio, these programs are better than using a signal generator and an oscilloscope, because they already contain a lot of pre-made signals and calculations. Much easier than doing all the hard stuff manually. Summarized, 
we found an easy way to use a general purpose PC with its sound card to create a versatile signal generator, an oscilloscope and a spectrum analyzer for audio signals. The only things we need are two cables and software. We found two free of charge software packages and used REW for our tests. We also saw that our setup has many limitations. The most important are its limited voltage and frequency range. For pure audio applications, this setup is probably better than using a signal generator and an oscilloscope, because it has a lot of built-in audio knowledge. It can be extended by adding a microphone, an amplifier and an ARTA box. With those extensions, you get an excellent tool to make loudspeakers or check your setup. Or you have a loudspeaker and find out its frequency response. We played with a simple RC filter and discovered how easy it is to remove unwanted frequencies. And we used an op-amp to create an active filter. This was all for today. As always, you find all the relevant links in the description. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. Thank you. Bye.